Just in case you'd forgotten that Christmas is just around the corner, and you blissfully fall asleep on the sofa whilst watching reruns of Love Actually, you might dream of Mariah Carey encouraging you to buy a particular brand of crisps, or a giant red Coca-Cola van screeching towards you in the snow, drowned out by tastefully remixed versions of iconic Christmas carols. You wake up bleary-eyed to find out you've not only spilled eggnog all down your new festive jumper, but you also appear to have been transported into the bizarre parallel universe of TV adverts, where everyone is more than happy to sleep directly on their mattress, and almost every brand wants you to associate them with the warm and fuzzy feeling of Christmas. As American author Dan Savage writes, Christmas can have a real melancholy aspect, because it packages itself as this idea of perfect family cohesion and love. And you're always going to come up short when you measure your personal life against the idealized personal lives that are constantly thrust in our faces, primarily by TV commercials. With that in mind, the question is, what are the actual techniques used by commercials to subtly influence the viewer to buy their product? Prepare to take a baseball bat to your TV screen every time your favorite show cuts to its commercial break because I'm Tom from Screen On Point, and this is how do TV commercials con you? It would be impossible to talk about manipulation in TV advertising without first mentioning the tobacco industry, an industry which was forced to think outside of the box to come up with creative ways to sell what is essentially a death stick. You wanna buy some death sticks? You don't want to sell me death sticks. When studies were released in the 1950s that showed that smoking caused cancer, the tobacco company Marlboro, which was originally targeted at women, changed its advertising tactics to target a male demographic, and famously ushered in what is believed to be the first example of lifestyle advertising. Which is when a company, instead of directly selling their product, attempts to sell an identity or image to align the product with a certain type of aspirational lifestyle. Marlboro achieved this by creating a character, the Marlboro Man, an archetypal manly cowboy who lived an adventurous and free lifestyle. Their adverts shifted from showing a lot of the product to showing more of this character and the ideal they believed he represented in the eyes of their male demographic. Graphic. Although it could obviously never be backed up by any hard evidence, the promise that the Marlboro Man adverts made to their audience was that smoking Marlboro somehow made you more masculine and gave you the freedom that cowboys from the Wild West were perceived to have had. And this kind of lifestyle advertising still exists today, one example being the more recent American advert for McDonald's. With its close-up shots of labels that read low-fat milk and rich in vitamin C, without directly stating it, the advert seems to be implying that a Happy Meal is a healthy lunch for a child. At the start of the commercial, we are shown a child struggling to adjust to sharing his toys with his new younger sibling. Once the mum has taken him to McDonald's and he learns to understand the concept of sharing by sharing a Happy Meal, they return home and he waves at his younger sibling, finally accepting him into the family. By implying that eating at McDonald's will result in children learning to share, McDonald's is arguably attempting to sell its audience not just its product, but the lifestyle of a happy and healthy family unit. An ideal which we can all agree can be attained by a couple of ropey chicken McNuggets and a strawberry milkshake. On top of lifestyle advertising, another common con in TV advertising is pulling at your pesky old heartstrings. To use Disney as an example, if you had to think of the most memorable scenes from a Disney film, it's likely that you'll think of Bambi's mother's tragic death or Mufasa falling into that herd of wildebeests in The Lion King. Part of what makes these two scenes stand out in your memory is arguably that they trigger an emotional response. Harvard researchers published the paper Flashbulb Memories in 1977, where they noted that people were able to vividly remember an event which had them shocked and caused a state of surprise, which supports that the idea that a person's memory can be influenced by their emotional state. By recognizing that there is a correlation between memory and emotions, we can see how it would make sense for advertisers to attempt to tug on your heartstrings, as they want us to remember the commercial and more importantly, their product. One example of this kind of emotional manipulation in advertising can be seen by looking at the commercial titled Friends Are Waiting for Budweiser's Don't Drink and Drive campaign. In a montage we see a man bonding with his pet Labrador over the years, and unless you happen to be a character from Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom where you've already had your heart physically removed, it's difficult not to feel a surge of emotion when the man leaves his dog to go drinking, and the text, for some, the waiting never ended, appears on the screen. 
by appealing to the audience's love of their own pet and reminding them of the loved ones in their life that they would leave behind if they were to be killed in a drunk driving accident, the commercial elicits an emotional response in the viewer and simultaneously aligns Budweiser's product with the love between a pet and its owner. Without explicitly advertising its product, which would arguably be in poor taste in a commercial about the dangers of driving drunk, Budweiser's logo appears on a beach towel and branded beer bottles are briefly shown throughout the commercial. As honorable as it may be for a company like Budweiser to dedicate a commercial to such an important issue, the cynical emotional manipulation on show and the fact that they can't seem to resist repeatedly showing their product anyway is a stark reminder that at the end of the day, Budweiser just wants you to buy their beer. To illustrate what makes tugging on our heartstrings such an effective advertising technique, we have to look at the relationship between emotion and logic. In his article for Psychology Today, Michael Levine writes that each time we make a choice, it is my belief that our left brain wrestles with our right. The left and more pragmatic side tells us to act logically while our right puts up a dramatic fight for following the heart's content. He then adds that it is said that emotions drive 80% of the choices Americans make, while practicality and objectivity only represent about 20% of decision making. With that in mind, the next time you find yourself sobbing through a commercial for chocolate biscuits, maybe it would be wise to think twice about purchasing the product, as if a company is trying to get us to engage the right side of our brain is it also attempting to prevent us from thinking logically about making the purchase. As American writer Dale Carnegie wrote, when dealing with people, remember that you're not dealing with creatures of logic, but with creatures of emotion, creatures bristling with prejudice and motivated by pride and vanity. It's almost enough to bring a tear to your eye. You know what will bring a tear to your eye? Cause-related marketing. First coined by American Express in the early 80s to describe their campaign to raise money to restore the Statue of Liberty, cause-related marketing is a collaboration between a corporation and a non-profit organization to promote both the corporation's sales and the non-profit's cause. So just how effective is cause-related marketing? Well, a 2018 poll by Cox Business Consumer Pulse surveyed 1,100 consumers and found out that 71% would spend more money at a business if it supported a positive social or environmental cause. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to note the hypocrisy of large corporations using a noble cause is yet another ploy to get you to buy their product. One example of this is the Burger King advert entitled Feel Your Way, which was apparently released to start a discussion about mental health while simultaneously selling you fast food, which studies like the one published in the journal Molecular Psychiatry have suggested that actually raises the risk of depression. On closer inspection at the dialogue, Not everybody wakes up happy. All I ask is that you let me feel my way. It's clear that Burger King are using the advert not only to appear to be addressing mental health issues, but also to have a bit of a dig at the previously mentioned mentioned Happy Meal, which just so happens to be made by their biggest competitor. The aim of cause-related marketing is for a company to tie its brand to a societal issue which is relevant in the lives of its target demographic. So if the next time you see some kind of social protest and you think of Pepsi's tasteless Kendall Jenner commercial, then the ad has had its desired effect. What's important to note is that the more diverse if the commercial is, the better that is for the company behind it. The fact that the Kendall Jenner ad was pulled for seemingly making light of protests against police brutality did nothing to harm the profits of PepsiCo, which actually saw a 3% growth in sales, despite the public relations hit they took from the commercial. When a commercial does create controversy, people often take to Twitter and other social media platforms to air their disapproval, inadvertently giving the company they're trying to make a stand against free advertising. In the cutthroat world of TV commercial, there truly is no such thing as bad publicity. Linda, the documentary is about me being an evil cow killer. <laughs> Oh, come on, Bob. There's no such thing as bad publicity. So while most of us are surviving on beans on toast and advent calendar chocolates to afford buying our extended family Xmas presents, it may come as a bit of a surprise to learn just how much money is regularly being spent on those pesky throwaway commercials. In their 2004 commercial entitled Le Film, starring Nicole Kidman and directed by Romeo and Juliet director Baz Luhrmann, Chanel spent $33 million. With the amount of money being spent on ads that can be 
as short as 30 seconds, you can guarantee that from the editing to the directorial choices, every frame of an advert is carefully chosen with the aim of persuading the viewer to buy their product. A quick glance at the Battlefield Earth style Dutch angles and low resolution of the UK ad for Sensodyne, you might think it was thrown together by someone with 5 minutes to spare and no knowledge of tripods. The Advertising Standards Authority's rules on advertising toothpaste include to not directly state the dentists have recommended your product, a rule that GlaxoSmithKline were criticised for breaking with their series of Sensodyne ads. With that in mind, the use of Dutch angles and low quality visuals could be seen as giving the commercial a sense of documentary style realism, as if it was filmed on the fly in a dentist's office and not a carefully constructed piece of advertising. The constant quick cuts with shots lasting no more than a second long implies that this was filmed secretly and creates the idea in the viewer that they are getting insider knowledge from healthcare professionals. The subtle implication of the editing and directorial choices made here is that the dentist would be recommending Sensodyne to their patients, regardless of whether they are being filmed or not. Debuting at the 2019 Oscars ceremony, Hennessy released a four minute ad directed by Ridley Scott. From expansive wide angle shots of giant creatures journeying through an alien landscape to the warm orange hue of the cave shots, the ad appears to be attempting to align the experience of drinking Hennessy with the grand philosophical ideas of Ridley Scott's alien prequel Prometheus. At the end of the commercial, we are shown an alien universe with the planets rendered as undeniably impressive visual effects. The camera then tracks back and pulls out of the bottle of Hennessy, suggesting that drinking it is equivalent to an epic Ridley Scott style journey through time and space. The text, each drop is an odyssey, appears on the screen, furthering this idea that within a bottle of Hennessy is a vast alien landscape that you can explore if you simply buy their alcohol. As epic as Ridley Scott's visuals are at communicating an otherworldly drinking experience, the harsh reality is the only journey you likely would take after drinking that bottle would be a journey out of the back door of a Weatherspoons on a Tuesday night to be sick all over your shoes. Marketing research company Kentar reported that just in the UK, consumers spend about 30 billion pounds in what is known as the golden quarter of advertising in the lead up to Christmas. So it's no surprise then if you wake up from an eggnog and roast potatoes induced food coma in front of the TV and you suddenly associate Christmas with buying the latest headphones or a new fridge freezer, what's clear is that companies have mastered the art of manipulating their target audience into buying their products through cynical television advertising. And isn't that what the holiday season's all about? Hey. You have a Merry Christmas, everyone. Thanks so much to Oscar Wallington for writing this cynical, cynical piece on Christmas. You can follow him at Oscar Wallington on Twitter. Thanks for watching that video. Please do like and subscribe. We upload two tasty and tenderized videos a week to sink your teeth into. And do let us know your thoughts in the comments. Make sure to follow us at Screen On Point and Tom A. Ransom on Twitter to satisfy my narcissistic need for acceptance and love. And you make sure you have a wonderful day.